Hi everyone, buonasera. I'm Marlene Nice. I'm the Deputy Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Rome. And I'm here with our team, with our guests, for our last installment of our series From Home to Space. We have a lot going on today. So I just wanna go over a couple of things that are gonna happen. So first of all, we're gonna have some video, so you'll be able to see that. We're also gonna have a discussion between our Environment, Science, Technology, and Health Counselor, Karen Bell, and our guest, our astronaut, Tracy Dyson. And then the second part of the event, we'll take questions from the audience like we always do. And I'll be on the Yahoo, cha the Yahoo channel I'm sorry, the YouTube channel, to take your questions and feed them to our special guest. Right now, I'd like to turn it over to Francesca Rea, il direttore della Agenzia Spaziale Italiana. Un problema col microfono, dovrebbero sentirmi tutti, ok. Chiedo scusa, dopo tante puntate ancora qualche incertezza, ma eh, è normale, eh, sono contento dell'ospite che va a chiudere questa serie, un ospite che noi del pubblico italiano, almeno una parte, conosce perché mh, ha partecipato, cioè, ha fornito la sua esperienza a un documentario che sia l'Agenzia Spaziale Italiana che la stessa ambasciata statunitense eh, ha promosso e patrocinato un documentario eh, che si chiama Lunar City, che è tuttora è in distribuzione sulle piattaforme e con eh, un, uh, un film, peraltro molto famoso, di First Man, e eh, appunto credo che in parte vedremo anche qualche immagine di quel documentario, quindi un'esperienza finale molto buona. Io mi permetto, uh, come si dice, non solo di chiuderla qui augurandovi una splendida ultima puntata di questa serie, chissà che non ci siano esperienze future perché molto abbiamo imparato, molto hanno imparato chi ci permette di realizzare tutto questo tecnicamente, tra poco potremmo diventare una tv, saremmo in grado di fare altrettanto. A te Marlene, buon proseguimento. Okay, so I'm going to read the um, statement that Alessandra Bonavina sent to us. Sorry, she couldn't be here in person. And I just wanted to mention the, the program will be in English today mostly, but grazie, Francesco. Um, Alessandra writes, I would like to thank the American Embassy in Rome for their kind invitation to participate in this event. I would also like to express my gratitude to the Italian Space Agency for their great help and support throughout the preparation of my documentary movie, Lunar City. And she says, hi, Tracy, I hope you're well. I would really like to thank you and of course NASA for giving me all means of help and support needed for the completion of this documentary. Tracy, I wish to express especially to you my heartfelt gratitude for your quite unique contribution You have brought a great sense of humanity into the movie story and have given us a clear sense of attention and understanding of the world around us, both for the earth and for space. Thank you for all of this. What a nice note from her. So now I think we're going to turn to our video that we have prepared to show. Are we ready for that? Quando osservi la Terra, da 400 km d'altezza guardi l'atmosfera da sopra e vedi la curvatura del pianeta. Sto cercando il modo migliore per descriverlo perché nessuna fotografia, nessun dipinto può rendere l'idea dei colori, così come delle forme, delle ombre e dell'universo circostante. Voi avete, avete presente un neonato. Pensate a com'è tenero e delicato quel bimbo mentre sta dormendo e respira. Ha un colorito meraviglioso sul viso e realizzate che si è appena affacciata alla vita. Non siete soltanto attirati da quella creatura, ma voi volete... Volete anche proteggerla. 
Oh mio Dio, qualsiasi cosa potrebbe distruggere la Terra, noi stessi forse. Hi again, everyone. I do promise the rest of our program is going to be in English, but you see, we did have some subtitles for you. Anyway, I hope everyone gets to see that documentary, Lunar City, at some time. It's really a great film. And now I'm going to turn it over to Karen Bell. As I mentioned, she's our Environment, Science, Technology, and Health Counselor at the U.S. Embassy. She'll be talking to Tracy Dyson. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening to everybody. Good morning to those of you in the United States. And uh, thank you for joining us. This is a really amazing opportunity to speak with an amazing person. It is my incredible pleasure right now to introduce Dr. Tracy Caldwell Dyson. She is a U.S. astronaut and a veteran of two major space flights, both as a mission specialist and as a flight engineer. Since she joined NASA in 1998, She's logged more than 188 days in space, including over 22 hours in three spacewalks. Her space flights have included a 13-day mission aboard the Endeavour to the International Space Station, or the ISS, where she operated Endeavour's robotic arm on highly technical repair maneuvers. Her second flight was a 176-day mission to the ISS, which included three successful contingency spacewalks to make major repairs on the space station. Dr. Caldwell Dyson has a PhD in chemistry from the University of California at Davis and a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from California State University, Fullerton. Her research, both as an undergrad and as a PhD student, has focused on intensely technical fields including a grant to study atmospherically relevant gas phase chemistry. Throughout many of her assignments with NASA, her work has spanned a huge range of space functions. She served as a Russian crusader on the International Space Station. She served as a spacecraft communicator for both space shuttle and space stations operations. And she's verified flight software in the Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory. After returning from her space station mission, Dr. Caldwell Dyson established and led an interagency disciplinary troubleshooting team that focused, focused on improving stowage and cargo transfer procedures aboard the ISS. Her many honors include undergraduate awards, doctoral prizes, athletic awards, and numerous NASA medals and commendations. As difficult as it is to condense such an extraordinary career in a few lines, I hope this gives you all just a taste of Dr. Caldwell Dyson's enormous accomplishments and achievements. Please join me in welcoming her to this webcast. So I would like to start with a question right off here. Um, in one of your first NASA assignments, you participated in testing and integration of Russian hardware and software developed for the International Space Station. From your experience there, what are the greatest advantages of multinational partnerships in space exploration? And then to flip that on the other side, what are the biggest challenges? Well, thanks, Karen. And I really appreciate that introduction. That was, um, uh, it was very lovely. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I um, would say, I think the greatest advantage is that it's really the only way to create unity. And if you think about it, um, it's, uh, it just makes sense to represent planet Earth that way, that we go as a multinational cultural uh, team to space. And then the biggest challenge, I think, is just not only recognizing that there are cultural differences, but also learning how to uh, compromise and negotiate within them. And uh, we have had several years of uh, uh, awareness and practice at that at NASA uh, with the International Space Station and our uh, pilot programs before that. 
So your background, your technical background, you have degrees in chemistry, you have experience in designing and constructing and implementing sophisticated hardware, and you have hands-on experience in your family's company as an electronic electrician and wireman, which congratulations, that sounds amazing. <laughs> so what sort of skills would you recommend a students today as they're looking at their own careers and how to prepare themselves? What sort of skills do you think they should be pursuing if they want to pursue a career in space exploration? Well, Karen, every time we have a selection of astronauts, we're always looking forward to what missions will uh, that class once they're through their training will uh, end up doing. And so what, um, what we're looking at today is not necessarily what we'll need tomorrow, but what I think are some real consistent skills that uh, you can focus on fall in two categories. We call them hard skills and soft skills. The hard skills are the technical skills. And I think that we in the future will always need uh, strong uh, skills in science, you know, the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math. I think that's a given. We are learning how to not only get to space, but to work in space and live in space. We're always going to need that kind of background. Then uh, some hands-on mechanical skills are always necessary whenever you're on an expedition, whether it's to space, uh, you know, uh, to uh, a foreign land underwater, you're always going to take things with you. They're not necessarily going to work or you're going to have to assemble them. And so having some kind of mechanical skills is, I think, vital for exploration. Then uh, problem solving is also a great skill. And that comes in many forms from the, the uh, mechanical to the, the thought process, troubleshooting, because things don't always go the way you plan them. And so those are some key things that Regardless of what your degree is in and your background, um, I think really serve well uh, an individual and a team and an agency when you're going forward and exploring. Then there's the soft skills, and that's something that you need just in life in general. That we all it's the the teamwork, the taking on a responsibility and um, exercising good judgment with it. Those are things that um, serve well, as well as communication. Just uh, learning that there are various styles. And, and how and when to employ each one of those, because we run the gamut from face-to-face -face communication with our crewmates to um, uh, remote communications, delayed communications with the ground, where you have a short packet of time to uh, give information and it has to be succinct and to the point, and uh, you have to wait for a response. So uh, it's just to name a few uh, of the type of skills that I think we will look for in our explorers today, tomorrow, and beyond. Before we started our conversation this afternoon, you mentioned just really briefly that um, that they're looking for uh, this year's class. So as classes come in to NASA, they're looking across a, a range of specialties. I guess they're choosing uh, applicants who bring a, a variety of skills in the same package. So you're bringing, for instance, your chemistry background, background your technical background, your communication skills, you're fluent in Russian, right? Um, so that makes that person a very unique package compared to somebody else who may come in on the same class, it sounds like. Exactly. We have certain uh, disciplines that we uh, uh, categorize people in. Uh, you know, we have pilots all the way to physical mm -hmm. scientists, um, to doctors, engineers, etc. And so, but there's there's basic qualifications we look for in anyone, and that's you know an advanced degree and and um, relevant work in your special field, and um, and then beyond that, we look for uniqueness. I'll I'll just. Um, say that in general and that takes on a variety of forms and i would hate to, to even dish out some of the examples because it might um you know give someone the notion they need to go do that thing but what i encourage people to do is go do the things that you enjoy doing because that is regardless of what you're applying for is going to make uh, is going to um, bring out the best in you and when you enjoy what you're doing you you do amazing things. The, the, the God-given talents that you have are going to flourish under those conditions. And then if your path brings you to the space program, wherever, you know, whatever country you're in, then um, those skills just may be the thing that um, your agency is, is interested in pursuing. 
but at, at the very least, it brings joy into your heart. And I think that that's really what life is about. Well, as part of my own work, um, I've, I've done ESTH work and several posts now. And one of the, the constants is we talk to a lot of students. So they come in and they have these great ideas of what they would love to do, where they could imagine themselves in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and it's sometimes uh, quite a challenge to, to give that overall advice, you know, find a unique spot, find what you're good at, do what you're good at, and, and continue to pursue opportunities. Um, along those lines, your bio also states that you helped establish and lead a troubleshooting team focused on improving stowage and cargo transfer. We're talking about the next steps. We're not talking about to the moon and back. We're talking about to the moon, orbit, possibly to Mars, possibly to another mission. So those cargo transfer processes, it seems like this would be a really prudent path for uh, aspiring astronauts to, to include as well. Uh, the logistics background, how do you maximize your space while minimizing risk, those sorts of things. So do you think logistical specialties is something that might be a useful path for people that aspire to space? I'm going to say yes, because you hit the nail on the head. The, um, sometimes it really, when it comes to maximizing your time um, and, and the work, and efficiency is a word we use quite often, stowage can really, excuse me, honk that up. And so um, the logistics are really what um, create the opportunity to do the, 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 the research, the exploration. And so if you don't have a really good foundation in that, you have little time to do what you went there for. Having said that, I, I think that um, there are very creative ways that um, you, you can explore you know, logistics and, um, and even practice it in your own environment, your own home, which is what I've done <laughs> and I've employed a lot, of, a lot of the practices I um, have at home, uh, some people would, would make fun of, but uh, they, they served well in the environment uh, that I was in, in um, on the space station. But I would say that, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't so much direct somebody to go into logistical, um, you know, studies because I, I just don't know if that's enough to, to bring somebody in, in these current, uh, times. But I do think that that's one of those unique areas where if you have experience in that and you, you have demonstrated, um, effectiveness in that, that is definitely something that would be considered unique and valuable and, uh, not just for, NASA's purposes and, and our um, space exploration agencies, uh, just in life in general. So I would uh, I would encourage people to look at that. And then the twist for us is microgravity, and that's the part that was um, I think why I had a platform to speak on, not just because uh, we needed it, but because the microgravity environment or reduced gravity environment is so uh, so much a player in logistics, in cargo, in stowage, that, and it's an environment that we don't replicate on earth um, to a great extent in order to test these out. And so it really takes a flip in your mind to then take the practices that work well here on, in 1G, as we say, and then transfer them to that other environment where um, you can't lay things out on a table and expect them to stay there and count them and audit them and inventory them and move them around. They don't stay where it's like a trunk of butterflies. We say, I mean, it's just a trunk of stray cats. They just don't want to be there. And so what do you do in that case? Those are the kinds of uh, things we struggle with on the ground without that experience of space light and why people like myself with our experience tend to, um, be heard when we come back because <laughs> the experience is sometimes not very fun. <laughs> that's a long-winded answer to your question, Karen. But. No, that's that's perfect. It's really, I think more than anything, sharing what it's like to, to deal with some of these challenges. Um, it, it opens up doors in the imagination. So we're at a really interesting point uh, in our history of space exploration, and we're shifting now from the government-funded, nationalistic sort of approach to more of this multilateral, uh, almost commercial-driven in, in some aspects, uh, next steps when it comes to the exploration process. What sort of support do you think that governments should be supplying to space exploration? And how do you see the role 
for uh, commercial enterprises to, to enter into this new partnership as well. How do you see that going in the future? Um, I know I'm kind of waiting with bated breath because uh, well, I've been in, I've been uh, an astronaut for over 20 years and uh, I was in the program before we started to really uh, harness the power of uh, our private industry. And so I've seen a, a huge shift and, and I, I, I grew up without it. And now I'm kind of like living in, in a uh, commercial um, program today. So what I've noticed looking back at it is that the government, um, the, the government focuses on people and commercial companies focus on profit. And if they're good commercial companies, they focus on their people as well. Uh, but that's one of the big differences. Government's not trying to make a profit. And so uh, you're really looking at the, the government's really looking at the mission at hand. Um, at least when I say government, I say NASA. We're, we're looking at the mission and uh, what, how to be the best steward of the resources that our uh, taxpayers have helped provide. And, um, and so I think government support should be that um, sort of the, I, get, I think the best word to say is sort of the, the, the professor, the watchdog, the one that um, kind of sets the goals and make sure that we stay in line, we, we uh, protect our people and we pr protect our investment for the, the, the greater good and to use this opportunity to create peace um, while providing opportunities for commercial companies to explore this environment and open it up to a greater sector of our population than just these um, specialized, highly qualified individuals going down a certain path, i.e. astronauts. But uh, we, we would just not be able to uh, make low Earth orbit or space, deeper space accessible to the, the, the public at large if it weren't for the commercial companies stepping up and taking um, a risk with this investment and trying to harness um, low Earth orbit and make it more accessible. Now, it's, it's a fascinating time and there are a lot of paradigm shifts. So it's, uh, again, beta breath, that's perfect. We're all sitting here watching it with the same beta breath, but uh, yeah. Um, speaking of change, Last summer, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. It was uh, it was just great here. Um, we hosted a movie and showed you know the steps leading up to the launch and and the actual first steps on the moon, and it literally made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It was so cool. Um, however, every photo they showed of the control room, it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of short haired white guys with short sleeve shirts and, you know, a lot of heavy black glasses, but it was just so uniform. And I think there's clearly been a change in, uh, in, in diversity. Um, what is it like these days to work at NASA? Are, what, what, how, how has the situation changed? Well, it's a lot. Uh, there's there's a variety of people that you see in the control center today. Of course, uh, you in terms of uh, you know gender, race, uh, mm -hmm. background, uh, hair color, you name it. It's um, there's just a variety of of um, people, personalities, and it's broader. It's a, it's a much it's diverse, and. Um, I would say that the when I look at the old footage, I, I think back then um, there's a whole lot more going on behind the scenes than in the footage that we see. And I know that there were women um, as well as other um, uh, people of other cultures um, working in the background, probably not the majority like you see today. Uh, but one thing I can say is those of us who were then considered a minority uh, remember those those few that you got to see in movies like um numbers figures um hidden figures that uh they are the shoulders in which we stand it's um it's true that we we don't take for granted the freedom that we have to sit on console to to be in the cockpit to uh, be the one uh design the the next generation spacecraft or elements of it that it's all because of the people who persevered before us that you may not have seen in the footage, um, but they persevered 
with the utmost professionalism and they kept their eye focused on the mission. And it's only years later when they are well out of that field and, and enjoying the later years of their life that you find out the ways in which they suffered and, and the, the degree of their fortitude. So it's looking at the diversity today, what it's like um, being at NASA, there's just, I think, tremendous gratitude for those who stuck with it and paved a way for the rest of us. Thank you. Well, I think our time is actually working pretty well. So I think I'm going to get all of my questions in today. Um, my last one is this, and this is coming from my personal interest. It is truly awe-inspiring to speak with somebody who has walked in space and then come back to tell the tale. That you all are a unique fraternity, sorority. Um, you're, you're a unique group of humans. And I would love to hear what do you think is the most memorable part of your experience in these spacewalks? What what just strikes you when you're looking back on your time there as the most amazing part of that? Oh gosh, um, it's really hard to pick just one because, like you said, it's a it's an amazing opportunity and situation. And I did three spacewalks and. Even the time leading up to the spacewalks, there was moments of, of amazement for me personally. Um, and then for our agency and for our, our you know, our um, international partners who have invested so much into this, um, the space station and the operation of it and what comes out of it, that um, the situation we were in was amazing. Uh, where we had a critical critical component fail, and we had a short period of time to go out and fix it. Otherwise, we would be faced with some drastic measures. So, and and everybody in the entire world that um, has a hand on that space station was involved in the um, the repair. There was myself and my partner who were in the puffy white suits out in the vacuum of space, turning the wrenches and things, but. Oh boy, there was um, an incredible a number of people around the world that came together to not just um, help choreograph and execute those spacewalks, but think about it. We had our power go down and we had to, we had valuable science in, in specialized freezers that we had to transfer and we had to jump power from one rack to another. I mean, we had, our crew was not just working outside the space station. We were prior to that working inside with the ground, with all the control centers around the world, trying to protect science. And, and we were up all night transferring things and plugging things in and all of that. So to say one amazing, one memorable part is um, leaving out a host of incredible feats during that short you know, two week span that we did those spacewalks. But for me personally, one of the moments that I'll never forget um, that just touched me. And I went out the hatch all three times, not expecting uh, an opportunity to really soak it in because a spacewalk, even though you're out there, you're in your suit for upwards of 10 hours and um, you're actually out the hatch for, um, we plan for six and a half hours, but we our spacewalks were closer to eight hours because of the circumstances. And so in that period of time, you're, you're still, you're not expecting to have an, a moment where you can just take breath and, and, and gaze at the heavens. You, you, you have um, people talking in your ear, you got do buzzing at you, you've got tools you got to figure out. And oh, by the way, you got to hang on. And so the moment on my second spacewalk, I had been sent um, and it was a change of plan. We uh, last minute before we went out the door, they said, oh, by the way, TC, we're going to take you out on the starboard end of the truss you're going to find this valve and um, this is all in technical terms, but it boiled down to there's a valve out there. We want you to position yourself and wait for wheels to um, operate this other valve. And if he, if that valve gets stuck, then you have to operate this valve, but go out there and wait for him, wait for him to do that. So I got sent, I was okay, Roger that I'm doing my thing. I go all the way out to the starboard end. And that's um, I mean, that's a, that's a few, uh, it's about a hundred meters from uh, the airlock. And my partner is not anywhere near me. He's, he's on the other side of the truss. I can't see him. And so I'm out there all by myself and I'm hanging out what looks like the end of the space station, but I'm right near a solar array. And I'm basically on the front end of the space station. So I'm just hanging out. I got myself positioned. I'm hooked. I'm safe. And I'm waiting. And I can't tell you in a spacewalk how um, arduous that could be because 
you, you feel like you need to be doing something. And it just, uh, by God's grace, was um, one of the most beautiful moments. I could tell I, I had my face basically facing aft. The station's going this way. The sun's behind. The sunrise would be behind me. And all of a sudden, I start to see what is usually in darkness, a blue solar ray start to glow orange like the filament of a toaster. And I, and I catch it out of the corner of my eye. And I was like, the sun's coming up because the solar rays just start to glow this beautiful orange when, and the sun isn't even over the horizon. It's just the light is peeking up and it's um, striking the solar ray. And so then I like unhook myself and I position myself so I could watch this, this incredible God given gift uh, because nobody's talking to me yet. <laughs> They're talking to my partner and I was like, Oh, and so I turn around and I got to watch the, the most incredible sunrise of my entire existence. I'm, I'm convinced I will never see something as, as, as breathtaking as that. And I didn't cry because I knew I had to keep my stuff together um, because any minute they could call me and say, all right, turn the valve. And I'd have to like get myself back into place. But it was just a moment of peace in such a, um, a focused period of my, of my life. And it was such a gift. And I will, ne I would take it with me all the time. I will never forget that moment. So that was probably my most memorable. You literally just gave me chills describing it. That that just sounds so <laughs> stunning. Um, wow. Uh, so before we shift and go to some of the questions that our viewers have sent in, one last one from me. Is there anything you can share about your future plans? What do you think comes next for uh, a person of your rank, your accomplishment? Um, what's next for you? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, but... Uh, I am, I can just say that I'm eligible for assignment and I am waiting for um, a flight assignment. Like you said, someone with my experience level, uh, those slots are hard to come by because um, we are trying, we're making an effort to fly our rookies, our folks that don't have as much flight experience. And so um, I, uh, I don't know when a slot comes up that doesn't have, that, that has the, the, the level of responsibility that someone like with my experience would, um, would take on, but I do have hope and I, and, uh, I haven't been asked to leave. So I, uh, I think there might be another flight in my future. At least I'm praying for that. Uh, but in the meantime, I am using all that experience that I've gained, uh, to help support the missions. In fact, that's the majority of what an astronaut does. We spend a fraction of our career in space, but most of the time we're spent uh, down here and we help develop, um, we help develop procedures, operations, um, equipment, um, you name it. And um, we also support the missions as capsule communicators, as support um, technical consultants on things. We train other, I train, I train uh, baby astronauts uh, in uh, all things um, basic training related. So, uh, I'm busy and I don't plan to, to leave anytime uh, real soon. So. Wow. Well, thank you so much. You have answered um, all of my questions and this has just been fascinating. Thank you for your thoughts. And I think we'd like to go back to Marlene and see if we can get some of the questions in from our viewers as well. Um, over to you, Marlene. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. And thank you, Tracy, for all of those great stories. We do have a few questions from our, our viewers. I'm going to start from top to bottom. Maria Perina wants to know, would you like to be the first woman walking on the moon? Nice segue after we just asked what's next for you. Well, heck yeah, I'd love to be the first woman walking on the moon. Um, I, uh, I think there's a, a few other ladies in my court that would uh, share the same sen sentiment, uh, but I think uh, all of us who are in the program and, and have been working at this for uh, a good part of our life um, would find that to be uh, an ult the ultimate privilege. Then they'll make even more movies about you, first woman. Um, another question <laughs> along those same lines is uh, someone named Superstar asked, would you be the first person to set moon on Mars? Or set foot on Mars, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that one I'm not so sure about. Uh, I think that someone who is, um, Kind of going through school right now is probably going to be one of our first uh, footsteps on that planet. Uh, but what I can say is that I'm doing a lot of work today, along with my colleagues, to uh, help make that mission possible. Well, 
Okay. Roberto Loreto asked, um, thinking of the boxes, and maybe it's this crazy, maybe she's thinking outside the box. Is there any idea to make a child travel to space together with adult astronauts? Have these constraints been explored? Mm. No, I think um, <laughs> there's a lot of ways I could answer that one, but I won't try to be funny. Uh, but um, no, it's not being talked about. I, I could, um, I often wondered what it'd be like to have my dog with me, my dogs, and uh, that would scare me to death. Um, but no, I think, it, I think that we have to be um, a little bit more routine uh, with getting into space and operating in it. There's so much uh, to consider and so much responsibility, so much risk if you're not well-trained that uh, I don't think it would be safe. And then there's also uh, microgravity and the effects on our physiology to consider. And we are just trying to understand on the adult human body what the effects are and what the countermeasures should be. I don't know that we're close to figuring out the effect it would take, the effect it would have on a developing human being like a child. So we might be further from that possibility uh, for those reasons once we even get our travel to space more routine like uh, air travel is today. Can you talk a little bit about that? What's the physical toll on someone who travels into space who, and even just going through the program preparing to get to space? You can think of it in, I think, two ways. There's short duration and there's long duration. And, uh, and just take low Earth orbit where we have explored today minus the moon. Um, if you have a short mission like two weeks, then you, your body hasn't, it's, it's adjusted to microgravity, but you haven't had as many physiological changes like you do when you're there for six months to a year. Um, but things like muscle, muscle mass, um, you, we see a reduction in muscle mass, bone mass, um, flexibility, um, as well as there's, um, for some, an effect on immunity. And the, we have studies ongoing where we're, even, we're human subjects um, on board the station to understand those effects. But we also employ countermeasures uh, such as exercise. And we have a pretty rigorous exercise routine on board to help mitigate uh, any muscle loss and bone loss in particular. Um, but without those countermeasures, you could find yourself stumbling out of a capsule. You could find yourself um, uh, with vestibular effects. So like after, you, if you've been on a, a spinning ride, that effect that you feel um, once you're done spinning and your, your environment is stationary, but your head is still like whizzing around, that um, effect could last longer um, than for some uh, versus others. But if you don't have any countermeasures, uh, the, that effect could debilitate you for a little while on the ground. But we've had some success with our countermeasures in uh, getting people uh, recovered much sooner. But if you go further from uh, low Earth orbit, then there's radiation. Um, I mean, we still have radiation concerns, and we monitor those uh, on, even in low Earth orbit. But as you go away from Earth and the protection of our environment uh, into other, um, you know, to other planets and just into free space, the, the radiation is a huge concern, and the mitigation to that plays a role in even air, uh, spacecraft design. So uh, it's complicated. Uh, it's a complicated problem to solve. Okay, we have another question from Roberta. She says, um, how are astronauts supported during their training to balance emotional and rational sides dealing with the unknown space challenges? I guess emotional and intellectual sides. Well, we do have a group called the Behavioral Health and Performance Group, and uh, we call them BHPG because we turn everything into an acronym. But uh, they are a team of uh, medical professionals, um, psych you know, psychological, uh, psych psychiatric, as well as behavioral health um, professionals. And they are a team that has had a lot of experience at dealing with um, uh, mental health and, and wellness and um, how to persevere in confined spaces. And we also do a lot of analog training where we go out to the wilderness as a crew and um, we experience challenging environments as a, as a crew. And we take one of our behavior health folks with us to help us work through these things. And we spend a lot of time 
uh, developing techniques and um, creating uh, camaraderie and really just self-awareness um, is one of the, the biggest favors that you can do for yourself. And, and in that, it's not just knowing yourself so that you keep yourself in check, but knowing yourself like when you are getting tired, when you are getting edgy, what kind of situations um, bring those on in you and being able to recognize them is, is first um, a challenge, but necessary, but then having a way to deal with them is another. And so we, we spend a, a good deal of time uh, focused on those uh, aspects of space flight. And we have a team of professionals and opportunities, other training analogs to help us exercise uh, uh, good practices. We call them expert, expeditionary behavior uh, skills. Okay, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about Hollywood. So I grew up watching the original Lost in Space, the original Star Trek series, all of those. You know, I'm not a scientist or an astronaut. I just am a space aficionado like many of our viewers here. So how true is it, aside from the first family in space, because we know we're not sending children to space, but <laughs> how, how real are those things? And how do people like you work with Hollywood to make sure that things are factual or believable? Um. Wow, there's been so many space movies out there and some of them, I would say there's always merit in each one of them. Some of them uh, stick out to me for different reasons, uh, but and not all of them do have um, astronauts consulting. They have other professionals in, in the space agency giving them uh, guidance. But I think Hollywood has a tough job. They have uh, only you know two hours basically to uh, tell a story, and um, space travel takes a lot longer than that. So they end up uh, taking shortcuts or abbreviating things, or even just for the flair of it, um, taking some some pretty strong liberties. Uh, but you know it's it's telling the story, and so I think uh, as, you know speaking personally with a background in in uh, being an astronaut. I appreciate what Hollywood tries to do. There are times when you're sitting there and you're like, oh man, that's, that's not real. Um, but um, I've actually had a chance myself to work with um, Hollywood on a, on a couple of projects and uh, can appreciate the uh, limitations that they have. And, I, and what I appreciate even more is when they do reach out to NASA in some way, whether it's to have an astronaut help out or um, another very qualified um, professional to uh, help guide them and answer their questions. I really have a lot of respect uh, for um, uh, directors and producers that do that, like Alessandra. So even when they make movies about embassies and diplomats, I have that, ah, oh, no way moment. So I can relate <laughs> to that a little bit. Do you have a favorite movie? <laughs> a favorite, favorite space movie? movie? I have um, a couple. I, I love the right stuff. I love the right stuff because um, now, you know, since becoming an astronaut and even being in places where I knew those guys were, I just have so much, so much respect uh, for our first uh, astronauts and everything that they faced uh, to, like I said, just persevere and do and do this thing that no one else had done, even in the face of ridicule and mockery. They, uh, they held fast to the mission, and it's because of those guys that we get to do this today. Otherwise, we'd still be talking about it instead of doing it. So I love that movie, um, and I, I'm, I'm a bit partial to, uh, 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 to uh, the, uh, the movie that um, Alessandra made because I really like the artistry that she used to, to tell a technical story. If you were to ask any astronaut, we'd start focusing on, you know, vectors and and um, propulsion and and um, flight plans and things like that. And she used um, artistry in visual arts and um, musical art, combined it all, and gave you um, a real love for the technical part without ever um, opening up a, a, a doc technical document. So I really, I really liked. Uh, uh, liked her movie as well. Okay, and we have a few questions that came in in the meantime. Eugenio Gargioli asks, what about the habitability of Russian and Western elements of the ISS? He wants to know what's the difference in those areas inhabited by the different countries that are up in the ISS? 
Well, some of the differences are um, the, the modules are different. Um, it's kind of interesting. Just uh, I could spend a lot of time just comparing and contrasting the the, um, the vehicles on the Russian side as well and, and from the U.S. side. Um, but I, if I, I'd take too long if I went through all of that. But this um, a stark contrast that um, the the Russians uh, the, their strength is in their robustness. Um, they they build a component and they build it sturdy and reliable and it's um, it's simple and it's going to work every time. Um, and that's their strength. Uh, and I'm generalizing this, but on the U.S. side, our strength is in our complexity and redundancy. And so we have a box and it's special and it does a lot of funky things um, that we needed to do. Um, but it could be fragile and it could be flaky. And so we have three of them, um, but it, it, it does a bunch of um, whiz bang stuff. And I'm really generalizing this. Um, and so that's kind of a compare and contrast of the vehicles The the interior is is uh, much different. Um, our uh, U.S. modules are they were sized to fit in the payload bay of the shuttle. And so they tend to be um, a bit bigger, whereas the Russian modules were launched on a, on a rocket, a, a Soyuz or Progress rocket, rocket and, um, and they were they're a bit smaller and streamlined for um, those aerodynamics and, and fitting on that size rocket. And so a little bit of size difference, but um, and hatchways had to, um, we had to create adapters to fit the, the Russian side to the US side. Um, but as far as um, crew go, the, the people inside, um, our, our bond really transcends the, the whatever's happening you know, geopolitically um, down below. In fact, I've been up there and, and supported missions where there was turmoil between our countries um, to some degree while we we're up on the International Space Station. However, operations on board uh, remained steady because of the bond that we share. And we all know Russian, we all know English, um, and sometimes it's a funny combination, a funny conversation because either if you're tired or you're in a hurry, you might speak your own native language. And just because we all understand technical uh, language, whether it's in Russian or English, and we know body language and we know what's supposed to happen and we know each other because by this time we're living and working together, we still are able to communicate that we might be using two different languages simultaneously to, uh, to, uh, to talk. So uh, I'm not sure if this is getting to answering uh, your question, but uh, those are the thoughts I have on, on some differences between the two sides, just talking about the International Space Station as an example. Yep. And we really like to hear your personal experiences and how you feel with all those things too. And I wanted to ask you generally, do you see the space exploration and research, is it still hugely, hugely competitive internationally, or are you seeing a lot more global collaboration? Like Italy and the US have very good collaboration on space issues, but around the world, what are you seeing? Uh, well, what, I, would don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say my peephole is, is the largest because I'm technically down in the trench working things, but what I see, is a lot of co a lot more cooperation than I see competition, um, and competition. If there if there is if you saw competition, it, it's a healthy level of it because we all kind of need that boost and, and motivation. But from the NASA perspective, what we what we hope to accomplish is is opening up the opportunity. We we tend to be the integrators, the leaders, the coordinators because. We, along with Russia, have the most experience at doing this, and so it kind of makes sense that we would be the ones to shepherd the effort, and but bring in um, our partners and make them partners, and um, and recognizing that our country can't do this alone. We might be a country uh, dedicated to it, but financially um, and motivationally, uh, we need the cooperation and the participation of of our planet if we ever hope to. Uh, slip the surly bonds and go and, and explore further. And it just makes so much sense to do it as a planet, right? Than it does to do it as an individual country uh, trying to go further and farther. So um, I, I see a lot more cooperation at my level and even at the, the program level, the managers that are making all the decisions and, uh, and the serious compromises uh, with an eye on the future. I, always seen um, in open forums an effort on the part of all the agency leaders to really uh, collaborate more than 
compete. And then even when it comes to the countries that aren't part of our partnership, we still do what we can within, um, within our guidelines to, to help um, usher them along in their efforts. And so uh, I just see NASA in particular trying to uh, uh, partner, partner more than anything. I'm repeating myself now. No, that's nice to hear because we are one world. Uh, before we go to the last, the, there's a few more questions here. I wanted to share with you a comment that we got on our Facebook page. It's from Ohio, but one of the team wanted, wanted to share it with you. And someone wrote in, great interview. Thank you from Ohio. How blessed, what a story. I hope she realizes the positive effect she has on females for the next generation. Wow. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Especially my husband's from Ohio, so uh, um, I like to Did hear he from that. that. Did your husband write that? <laughs> oh! <laughs> I, got to ask him. I, I don't name. have a name. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so back to the questions. I have one from Bianca C. Actually, two from her. We'll take them one at a time. Bianca C. asks, or says, I am an astrophysicist, university student, who will sooner or later have to choose an area of the field to focus on. I was wondering which of the astrophysics areas fascinates you the most? And she, well, let me just continue. It's all part of the same question. She says, everything is so interesting. And because of this, I imagine choosing a specific field that will be really difficult or just choosing it will be really difficult. And she says, thank you also for the From Home to Space series. Well, well, um, astrophysics, I, um, I would say my, my knowledge of that is really limited. Uh, so my favorite part about it, I think most fascinated part, fascinating part is, um, what I've had to learn in, um, all of my rendezvous training. Um, uh, and I've had a lot of that, a lot of experience in, in rendezvous, uh, and I find fascinating orbital mechanics especially when you go to the moon or other um, orbiting, orbiting celestial bodies uh, and the dynamic of, of having multiple orbits and how they all interact and they're all a function of, of distance, not only from their, um, their home planet, but uh, the effects that other gravitational fields have of nearby planets. And, and so I'm a chemist, remember, so I, I'm not an astrophysicist, but um, the astrophysicists who have come and briefed us, excuse me, um, especially recently about moon, uh, moon missions, lunar landings, we have um, these uh, halo orbits and, um, and multiple orbits that we're talking about entering to, um, to not only have a, a gateway space station around the moon, but, but also to pick us uh, an orbit in order to come to the surface and make that a little bit more um, routine rather than just the one shot from Earth to the moon and landing. And I find all of that just to be um, fascinating, the mystery that's out there that we can't see, but we can feel and we can interact with it. And um, I think that there's a lot more to be discovered in that regard, so. Okay. Antonio Palozzi asks, to shorten time of flight to Mars and so the exposure to radiation, there were studies on nucle nuclear propulsion. Do you know if there is something really going on in the short time in that direction? I do. I know that there are uh, groups looking at um, propulsion using various means, even uh, nuclear energy. So there's a lot of focus on shortening that trip and making it more accessible, as well as um, you know, positioning an interstage somewhere in orbit. There, there we are back to our astrophysics. Um, and so there's, you know, the consideration, do we go right from Earth to Mars? Because that's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take a lot of time. But if we can do this in, in stages, increments, where we transfer to a space station and then use another form of energy to get ourselves to, to Mars, that could uh, reduce the amount of time as well as materials and, and propulsion that it takes to get there. If you can dump your, your heavy stage that got you into orbit and then use a uh, lighter propellant to get yourself coasting over to Mars, that could be a, a method. But yes, indeed, people are 
uh, dedicating careers right now to learning about it and trying to come up with a solution. Okay, and I think we have time for one last question from Roberta. She wants to know, if you could design a new module for the ISS, what activity would you dedicate it to? What kind of activity would you like to do in your dreams? Ooh, I would create a habitation module. <laughs> I would create a module for crew to um, separate themselves from their work. Right now, we, we, we do that in a number of ways. Uh, but they have to be clever and it shares functions with other we have modules that that share functionality like we cook in one but it's also where we stow uh, in critical hardware um we do science in one and sleep in it uh you know we we just have multifunctional uh, modules but if i had uh if i had an opportunity to design a module and stick it on the space station it would be uh, habitability module so we could feel like we were leaving work and going in and relaxing. It would include a window, but those are, those are hard to come by in space. And, um, it would include, uh, uh, rest areas just where you could like literally bungee yourself to the wall and just take a quick snooze if you wanted to, but that's in my dreams. Thanks for that question, by the way. <laughs> that's no a good one. Ever asked. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, Come to the end of our program. I'm really sad because I'm so enjoying talking to you. I enjoyed the interview with Karen. Um, before we let you go, I wanted to ask if you had any last words, and then I'm going to ask Karen and Francesco to come back on too. But any other words from you, Tracy? I just I, um, I too enjoyed uh, this time and these questions, and I have to agree the 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 format is. Um, just lends itself to just chatting about things in space and uh, we, we don't get an opportunity to have such a comfortable conversation. So I want to thank uh, you and your team for um, providing this opportunity for being interested in reaching out uh, for your thoughtful, very thoughtful questions. And to all the viewers that are thinking about space um, in this series, uh, I want to just encourage you to keep tuning in because we're doing this not just for as an agency to explore, but we're doing this for the world. And um, that's to answer questions and to involve more people. And so if this has inspired you in any way to become involved in space exploration, then uh, I've done my job today and hope that you will uh, pursue that in whatever form or fashion. It, uh, it takes literally a planet to do this and, and all different fields contribute to it. Uh, not just STEM, but in other artistic fields and medical fields and you name it. So I just would say to those that are watching today, I hope that this um, interest that you have in space is lasting and that uh, you'd go forth and uh, pursue uh, interest in it in, in other ways. And that's, that's about it. Thank you. Can we go to Karen first? And then we'll have the ultima parola per Francesco. Primo Karen. Uh, um, well, thank you again. This has just been a fascinating conversation. And anytime you want to continue this, I'm in. So just, just let me know and we can continue asking amazing questions about, yeah, come to Italy. We, we would love to uh, maybe host the next one here. So thank you for everything, for including me in this, uh, Marlene. And uh, thank you, Francesco, for making uh, your team available as well. All the best. Uh, I just uh, I just want to say some words in English to say thank you for uh, Dr. Tracy uh, Dyson for so fascinating uh, exposition, uh, fascinating exposition. Thank you to Karen to organize her life and uh, is uh, an interview about uh, the space uh, question about this uh, space in general. And I would like to thank Marlene and to Tiziana Gabiloro che hanno fatto un gran lavoro in questi mesi eh, di attività eh, costretta dal, dalla pandemia. Credo che abbiamo imparato un nuovo modo di comunicare e questa esperienza ci resterà per molto tempo e credo con notevoli frutti. And again, thanks to everyone. Francesco, you've been a wonderful co-host with me for this program. 
we've had so many wonderful American and Italian experts and including you have been fabulous. Karen, thank you for joining us today. Um, I have to thank my team, Fabio and Steven and Marco, and of course, uh, Tiziana, who is really the mastermind behind all of this. And Tracy, thank you again for joining us. And John, thanks again for helping us make it happen. I hope to see everybody in maybe a new season of From Home to Space. We haven't discussed that yet, but maybe we'll be like the TV station and have another season. Maybe we'll be renewed. Anyway, thank you all for joining us. I hope you'll watch these again. They're all recorded and you can find them on our YouTube channel. Goodbye from the U.S. Embassy.